You are listening to My Comic Shop History, part of the Flat Squirrel Podcast Network. Subscribe on iTunes, Podomatic, Google Play, or Spotify. The Flat Squirrel Podcast Network also includes four Patreon-exclusive subseries, My Super Fan History, My Comic Shop Book Club, The My Comic Shop History After Show, and, coming in 2019, Beyond My Comic Shop. Sign up at patreon.com slash mycomicshophistory for exclusive access to this additional content. Thank you. Welcome to the mid-season premiere of My Comic Shop History. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. After spending the summer talking about Superman and buying back issues, we are back talking about conventions once again. I am here on location at Metropolis Collectibles in Manhattan, and I am joined by the COO, Vincent Zerzolo. Vincent, welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. I'm so glad we were able to work this out. So you and I, we met in person at C2E2 back in April. Right. We had exchanged a few emails prior to that, but we met at C2E2. And then I came here to Metropolis over the summer and filmed you and your establishment here for My Comic Shop Country, the documentary. That, that was a lot of fun. That was great. As we speak, I am uh, I'm making my way through all of the footage, uh, and I'm having a great time uh, just kind of going through everything and starting to put it together. So, uh, again, I had a great time when I came here to film you, and I said, I gotta get, I gotta get back here. We gotta talk mm-hmm. again. Uh, about your comic shop history, but specifically about your experience with conventions, because you're such a veteran of the industry generally and uh, and of conventions. Now, for anyone listening to this who might not know you by name, you're the guy. You're the guy. Like, if someone needs to buy or sell an Action Comics number one, it's you. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> if, if they're not, they're they're leaving a lot of money on the table. But you, <laughs> but you, you and your team. Just to just to give some context yeah. for our viewers, so uh, you and your team, you are dealers of of a wide range of comics and original art, but specifically the most exclusive, highest end, rarest books. So yes, we do have a reputation for selling very high end comic books. We hold a number of Guinness World Records, and uh, that's that's all true. But it is important for people to know that we also cater to all levels of collectors and investors exactly. including guys who are buying comic books for a few dollars a piece all the way on up to fifty dollars hundred dollars hundreds of dollars thousands of dollars tens of thousands hundreds of thousands and so on and so forth uh, i think uh we're the only company in the world actually no i know we're the only company in the world who's sold i think we've sold about six seven figure comic books now we sold the first million dollar comic book action comics number one in 8.0 condition uh, that was in 2010 and a month later we sold uh, an 8.5 for 1.5 million dollars so it's um it's been a quite a thrill for me because as a kid growing up in rockaway beach queens i grew up in a middle class family really wonderful but uh, there was they weren't throwing money at me to go buy comic books so i was scrounging around for every quarter nickel and dime that i could get my hands on and walking over to a candy store on beach 129th street called allen's and there was a luncheonette as well run by a really lovely old uh, chinese couple that had a spinner rack in in the back by their counters where they'd serve egg creams and i would pick up uh, whatever comic books I could get my hands on and I have very vivid memories of that as well as a uh, tobacconist, tobacconist store on Beach 116th Street where I once in a while when we'd be going to the supermarket my mom would stop there so I could run in and find a comic book and a lot of those comic books I still have to this day and cherish them they're um, a really uh, important part of my childhood but the one thing is, if you ever told me um, as a kid I'd be dealing in these types of comic books and in my life, and this would be my livelihood and the way I design a lifestyle around, uh, I never have believed it. I think my head would have exploded if you told me I was going to sell a comic book for a million bucks. Yeah, I mean, understandably so. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, your your path from from those beginnings to where mm-hmm. you are now, but uh, to one of your earlier points. Uh, again, I think yes, we're we're all instantly drawn to the you know to the action one. And when I was here to film you, you very graciously went to the vault and you took out uh, one of the action ones, uh, graded, sealed up, uh, and you let me hold it. And we filmed that for the movie, and it was it was so cool. But as you said, right, it's not just the action ones. You guys do sell a whole range of books. And yes. I came across an interview you did, I believe it was at a comic convention, and you talked about how there are buyers for every type of book, mm-hmm. and um, you know books for every type of buyer, right? right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the things that's really important to note is that there's a budget for every comic and a comic for every budget. And people sometimes say, oh, you know, like, I don't I don't want to bother you with this thing. You have to understand, I came from 
a background where I was selling, uh, you know, when I was about 15 years old and started this, I had a partner and we would buy some Golden Age and Silver Age collections. But, you know, I also, when I started doing conventions, I was the guy with all the dollar boxes, you know, a dollar a book, $2 a book, uh, $5 a book, $10 a book. So I was wheeling and dealing in all types of stuff. And I have a tremendous appreciation for that type of uh, material as well as you name it, you know, anything. And one of the things I was taught early on in my career was that the customers that are spending five, 10, 15, 25, $50 per book this year could be the guys who start earning more money and later on come back and buy their amazing fancy 15 or their detective 27 from you. And I have seen that happen. One of the coolest experiences I ever had was this got to be about uh, 12, 13 years ago, a client uh, bought an amazing fantasy 15 for me uh, for 5.0 condition in a, in a 5.0 condition and said, you know, ah, this is like my dream book, my grail of grails. And he put it away. And then I saw him about, I don't know, 10 years later. And he came in and he said, look, I, I got married. I had a kid and I want to buy him an A of 15 now. And I was just like, oh, this is too cool. This is just, it's a, a really cool experience to be able to like sell to two, two generations. Hopefully this kid will <laughs> grow up and love comic books sure. like his dad does. Um, so uh, the other thing is really amazing is seeing people really understanding more and more what a great investment comic books are and how well they can do in the marketplace. Although I don't think that should be always be the primary goal. It is an incredible added bonus to being a comic book collector. The market is on fire. It's incredibly strong across all genres and including, uh, excuse me, almost all genres, I should say, but, and including, um, you know, gold, platinum, gold, silver, atomic, uh, bronze, copper and modern comic books people are just buying up everything and it's interesting to see yeah you know i have to say it's really been eye-opening and a learning experience for me you know spending a little bit of time with you i've spent a lot of time with ben from zap comics we actually uh, just came off of a four episode miniseries where we talked all about his back issue dealing and you know learning from you guys about just how robust this market is really has been fascinating for mm. me and hopefully for listeners uh, for listeners as well. Ben's a great guy. He's got a great operation, really knows what he's doing. Uh, love his setups at conventions. And from everything I've heard, he runs a really amazing store. I haven't been out there yet, but I hear it's uh, pretty fantastic. And that's, that's great because, you know, back in the day, there weren't as many what I'd call impressive comic shops. But I think nowadays people really have to be... Uh, step their game up, so to speak, to make sure that their comic stores are professional looking, run well, and um, their clients are serviced in a in a perfect manner because there's a lot of other choices and they can buy online, they can go other places. And if you make your store special and have a variety of product and and focus on you know certain things like some certain stores that are comic stores have great gaming sections other stores have great statue sections so everybody has like a little bit of a focus some guys focus on vintage comic books at their stores but it's really interesting to see uh how they've evolved um m my own comic book uh shop experience was very limited but uh, i learned a lot i i worked for um while i was in i went to st john's university and while I was there um, and dealing at shows, uh, I had a friend of mine who was opening up a comic store, uh, and he asked me if I'd like to work there part-time while I was in college. And I said, yeah, that'd be really cool. I'd love what to. What more could you ask for, right? Yeah, I know. It was really fun. <laughs> it wasn't far from, uh, from St. John's, and I started working, I believe this was probably in 1992, I think, uh, at Best Comics. Tommy Maletta is the owner of Best Comics. He's a fantastic guy. We're still friends today. He has, no, I haven't been, but I, I've, oh, you recommended them a while back, yeah. and I've, a couple of others have spoken about the store yeah. as well. Well, the thing about Tommy, he's got impeccable taste in terms of design for a comic store and lighting. He's a very professional guy. He really knows how to help customers, you know, and make them feel special. Uh, for me, uh, learning uh, from him, and um, hopefully maybe I taught him something too, I'm not sure, um, was, a, was a really cool experience, but we would, we would have, like, I remember we'd have competitions to see who could sell more of a number one uh, book that just came in that week to customers. And this was, this was really cool because, 
you know, our recommendations meant something and I loved to sell. So I would get there with a, with a client along the, the racks where the new books were coming in. So, and I, I really get into it and I had read a lot of these books. So I knew what, what I enjoyed and what I loved and I was able to recommend and seeing people come back and say, Hey, I really like that. And I'm going to keep going with that series. So that it was a very cool experience and it definitely taught me a lot. And once again, he still has his stores uh, going. I think he's on Jericho Turnpike in Long Island now and uh, still doing very well and um, keep in touch with him all the time. He's a fantastic guy. And he also sets up at New York Comic Con, has an amazing display of statues there. He, that's one of his specialties is right. statues. Yeah. Speaking of comic shops, so, you know, Metropolis is not a traditional local comic shop. You have a showroom, people can make an appointment and, and come and, and view the product and make a purchase. But you do have such a strong convention presence. Mm. And again, I want to get deeper into that. But do you find that uh, being at the conventions um, satisfies that, that comic shop feel for you where mm. you're actually you're having that foot traffic like somewhat akin uh, to what it would be like if you had a storefront and people were coming in? I have to say, I never thought about it quite like that. I, I, I appreciated my retail experience, but also um, found it to be, it can be a little bit uh, crazy um, having that many people coming into your store all day. And uh, I, I really do hand it to the guys who have a comic store and, and are able to, to do it as long as they can or, or are doing it. But I guess in a certain sense, I'm, I, I'm a people person. I really love to chat with people and talk to them about comics and, and art and passions of, of co collectibles, uh, pop culture, things like that. So, yeah, I guess in a certain sense, the, the conventions do help feed that need. So let's talk about your convention experiences specifically. So, I mean, when at what point did you get involved with conventions? Was it as a dealer first or as a, as a fan mm. slash attendee first? So when I was a kid, my friends and I, we collected comic books just like kids collected baseball cards and we trade them and stuff. And every once in a while, like somebody would have a birthday party and they would take us all out to a comic book show. Uh, I remember one of the first ones I ever went to was on, in Long Island. And uh, it was just, it was just so cool. It was just a, it was just a blast just to see so many comic books everywhere. And uh, and I'm sorry, not to date you, but what, like, what era are we talking? So here? I was born in '71. Um, I have two older brothers who are 10 and 11 years older than me, uh, and I was first exposed to comic books through their collections. And one of the coolest things I'd love to share with people, the first Hulks I read were Hulk 180, 181, and 182. The first X-Men I ever read were 95 through 100 and giant size number one. They didn't have the 94, but they had <laughs> everything else. And you, with the giant size, you were able to figure out what was going on. And um, I mean, if I, that's what you're starting with, it's not a surprise that it <laughs> grabbed you, right? That yeah, makes sense. No, it, it's, it's some of the best stuff out there. Uh, and I remember when I was a kid, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, John Byrne X-Men just was like unbelievable. I mean, I, I never dreamed in a million years I'd have ever seen a, a whole set of them, let alone in 9.8 condition or whatever, but just to to have those comic books go through your hands multiples of times is just a, a thrill. The little little kid in me is like jumping up and down and with, in joy <laughs> over those types of experiences. However, um, so I, st I started going to comic book conventions and I have another recollection of my, my mother and gr uh, godmother dropping me off at a convention in Manhattan. I probably, I gotta guess, I couldn't have been more than 12. And I think it was at where, where the uh, Big Apple conventions are here, um, which I basically, just to, if anybody out there doesn't know, I co-founded Big Apple conventions in 1996 with Michael Carbonaro. Yeah, I want to get to that yeah, in a moment. I'm more than happy to talk about it. It's one of my favorite parts of my uh, career. But, but uh, I went to this comic con book convention. I remember Conrad Eschenberg was set up there and I remember a bunch of other guys set up there and I bought a Marvel fanfare number two because they were sold out of number one and it was this Baxter paper comic book compilation story I think um, with Spider-Man and the angel and Spider-Man gets turned into a giant spider I think and I think that was literally my budget was three or four dollars or whatever I had in my pockets to buy something and it was just such a cool experience walking around a room just just chock full of comic books. I also uh, 
remember, you know, going away from comic books, so, you know, hit puberty, start learning about girls, start dating girls. And Other I, things are a little more important. Yeah, and then you get your heart broken. You realize, ooh, comic books won't break my heart. <laughs> so you yeah, go back to the comic books will comics. always be there for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, when I was around 15 years old, uh, my next door neighbor, um, who was about five years older than me, he wanted to start collecting and we were like, okay, let's start collecting. We would go to the Forbidden Planet in Manhattan, which was an unbelievable store. The new location, the, the last two locations were very cool, but the original location, which had a downstairs to it, was unreal and it had a downstairs filled with back issues and, and vintage comics. Nice. And I loved going to that store. In fact, I remember buying um, a uh, issue of The Question, I think it was number 13, where it has Question buried up to his neck and he's, they painted like a, an American flag on his face. And that was one of my, like, that was my, one of my first comic books I bought when I got back into it. And I, so I think I was like 16 years old when that came out. Uh, years later, I was fortunate enough to buy the original cover art to that. And it's hanging on the wall behind me. Yeah. I mean, you're the type of person you described earlier, right? Like you started with a certain budget and mm. you're at a certain level yeah. and you grew over time. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's true. That's true. And, uh, um, I, uh, I loved going to the conventions um, started setting up at conventions when I was in my teens with my first partner in the business. And we, um, we would basically go there, set up a table and wholesale out everything to other dealers. And then we'd leave. <laughs> it was really, we'd be done with the convention by like about 11 o'clock. Uh, I used to drive out to a comic book convention in Roosevelt, um, Rockville Center, excuse me, Rockville Center, run by Kenny Diamond, who owned, um, his family owned Flatbush Comic Books, Flat, Flatbush Comics, which was on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, which was when I got my uh, learner's permit, I would drive out there and I'd go and buy comic books uh, from that store. I'd been there when I was a kid once or twice. I remember finding a Boy Commandos number one and thinking I had found the Golden Age copy that was worth hundreds of dollars and it turned out it was the 70s copy that was worth yeah. like a couple <laughs> of dollars and it was just so funny. And, and so I had a lot of different comic book convention and, and comic shop experiences. Uh, I hope I'm not going all over the place, but as his memories are coming back to me, I just am spitting them out and sharing them. No, it's all uh, good. All good. Yeah. And so basically a lot of this uh, came together for me. I mean, I mean, when I drive out to Rockville Center, oh, so I didn't really say this, but there used to be a, a, a weekly newspaper that would come out called the Comic Buyer's Guide, where people would put ads for buying, selling, and, and uh, all types of stuff and articles about comic books. And it was a great resource to buy comic books. And we put an ad out, quarter page ad out in there, and people would call us up and I'd get r referrals from friends at school whose uncles or, or, or next door neighbor who was a plumber had a collection or found a collection. So we would be buying collections left and right. And eventually I would basically fill up my car with all the comics I bought and I'd go drive out to Rockville Center or to Fred Greenberg's Great Eastern Convention in Manhattan and I'd walk the room with a box of books and I'd sell whatever I could out of it and then I'd go Either it was empty or I'd bring the box back to my car and I'd start over with the next box and literally walk around to every dealer until I sold stuff. So, I mean, I was, I was hustling and it was, it was a great experience and, and learning to negotiate and go back and forth with people was, um, was very valuable. Also learning how to carry yourself in a business setting, even one as informal as a comic book business was a great learning experience for me. And those years at Rockville Center were, were very cool. Then, uh, as I got into uh, college, I basically, uh, when I was around 19, I took over the business by myself and uh, started setting up at conventions all through college. And those were really cool experiences. Um, when I was finishing up with St. John's University, I had uh, this moment where I, I'd gone to school for marketing and I said to myself, okay, I can wear a suit every day and take probably an hour and 15 minute to hour and a half train ride from Rockaway to Manhattan every day and then an hour and a half back to Rockaway every evening and wear a suit every day and probably make pretty shitty money for the first few years out of college. Or I can work in my boxers out of my apartment in Rockaway and probably make double that. And it really was not a tough decision for me. I, I loved comic books and I was... Um, I was very capable of, of doing this and I felt confident about it. And I also 
was really important. My father, I remember, was like, really, you're going to sell comic books? Or I should do it in my father's accent. I send you to four years of college, and you're going <laughs> to sell it. These are comic books. And I went, Dad, Dad, I promise I'll use what I learned in school to to build my business. And I did. I used a lot of what I learned in marketing um, and a variety of classes to help build up my business one of the uh, major goals for me, I, I, I was taught early on that if you, um, if you set out with goals and write down your goals, you're much more likely to achieve them. And my goal was to be the biggest comic book dealer in the world. And I had no idea how that was going to happen. But I said, if I'm going to do this, I want to be the biggest. I want to be the best. And that was 1993 when I graduated. And I actually, when I graduated from St. John's, I was, um, I was, uh, I met uh, a guy at a comic book convention in Brooklyn, a little show, who lived in Rockaway as well, and he was a comic book guy. His name's Kurt Bowlers. He owns West Village Comics, one of my oldest and dearest friends in the comic book business. And he said, hey, Vin, you should come out with me to sell comic books on the streets in Manhattan. And I said, really? He said, can you make money doing that? He said, sure, sure, yeah, come out with me. So basically, we'd load up my car, and we'd drive into the city and park at a lot, and we'd set up... And um, I remember the first day I made like 50 bucks and I was like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> Kurt, what are you doing bringing me out here? I, mean, I didn't cover gas or, uh, you know, parking. And he said, no, trust me. They just have to know what you have. The second day I did like 60 bucks. I'm like, dude, you're killing me here. What are we doing? He said, no, no, trust me, trust me. And so the third day I did like $200. I was like, oh, this is really cool. So we would set up uh, on streets on um, Broadway between John and Maiden. And we would... Um, have uh, I'd have two card tables filled with about eight boxes of books and we'd just stand there and people would come from the financial district and come by and there was like a row of us with comic books. There was probably like five, six, seven guys. And some of those guys I still know to this day. And we would have a great time. We'd be buying and selling and it was really cool. And I did that until the weather got really bad. And then I started um, basically uh, back in the early 90s there was a huge comic book boom and there were tremendous warehouses filled with boxes of comic books that were back issues that just didn't sell. And I was middlemanning these, these warehouses. So I'd find 100,000 books and I'd make a penny or two pennies a book and I'd flip them to a packager who would put them in those three for a dollar bags. And with some, I probably sold somewhere around a million comic books in, in the first year doing that, you know, warehouse to warehouse. I have a lot of fond mem memories of that as well. It was a very cool part of uh, business and growing experience, but and also very backbreaking and, and heavy. You know, you are hard to move. You know, hundreds upon hundreds of boxes. So you know, you have these experiences, and you're like, okay, this is cool. But I I had a love for golden age, silver age, bronze age comic books, and um, so I I started developing and building that up as well. And I was selling on the streets as well as doing the warehouse. Uh, middlemanning uh, business and I started doing a lot of conventions and it was a very cool part of my career early part of my career uh, one of the major things I realized early on was that I was competing against other dealers who had so much more knowledge than I did um, money much much more money than I had and experience knowledge customers you name it they i was basically starting at ground zero and 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 building a business from there and i i looked at it and it was a very, very conscious decision uh for me i mean other than working really hard to get great collections uh one of the things i was uh, aware of and one of the places where i thought i could beat a lot of my competitors was with customer service and I really, really went the extra mile. And I still do to this day. It's something that was instilled in me by my family. I grew up in the restaurant business, so I saw my parents very cordial with people and, and inviting, and also at our house as well. Uh, if you ask any of my friends if you ever were hungry and you needed a place <laughs> to go, you, sure. you came to my house and my mom was cooking up a storm within five minutes. So um, I learned a lot of that from my parents as well as... Um, uh, my, my older brothers. Uh, so basically I, I took that as one of the main places where I could really beat the competition and you combine that with great material and you have a winning uh, recipe for success. Uh, so I've started building that up through the nineties and, um, yeah, yeah, I could, I could go on for hours <laughs> about this, but, uh, yeah. 
No, that's terrific. And so, you know, in terms of these conventions that you're going to, so it, it's funny. Originally, I was planning for this episode to be sort of a uh, Comic Con history installment, and I quickly realized I think that's beyond the scope of what I'm looking to do here. But I thought it would be cool again to talk about your convention history, mm. and we'll kind of get at at that historical context through you and your experiences. So, like, what were the dominant shows of the day? I know you mentioned Fred Greenberg. Um, those were the Great Eastern shows. Were yes. there creation cons happening the, at this time too? There were creation cons. I wasn't as familiar with those, uh, but I'm sure I must have gone to one or two. Uh, the Great Eastern conventions were the major ones. Uh, there was the Rockville Center show. There were a couple of other conventions in Long Island. Uh, there were some shows in in Brooklyn, in Queens, but the main one was or the that monthly Fred Fred Greenberg Great Eastern Convention, which was just you know that's where the money was, and it, as well as Rockville Center. Rockville Center in the early days there was a ton of money in Long Island as well. And so, what were these shows like? Because you know, for listeners who are you know maybe a little bit newer to this and are more familiar with the New York Comic Con or San Diego, you know the the dominant shows of today. I mean, what were these conventions like? It was um, like kind of not the wild wild west, but something that, yeah. something like that. I mean, there was just deals going on. I remember I, like one time I bought this great golden age collection and showed up at the convention. I tried my best to price it what I thought was right, and it was a feeding frenzy of people buying and 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 God knows how much money I left on the table. But you know, was, that's that's those are the times you 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 learn from those experiences and you get better at your pricing and grading. And um, it was it was just a blast. Um, I, I I learned a ton and made a lot of uh, very uh, valuable friendships and relationships with uh, dealers and customers, um, customers who became dealers. Uh, so it's it's been it it was it was something I really cherish. Uh, I don't know how I would have been able to um, accum- accumulate that type of knowledge without going to those conventions. And I believe nowadays there's it's a lot more because the market's a lot more transparent due to. Uh, all the pricing information that's online between GP analysis, um, our sites, archives, uh, past sales, other sites, past sales, eBay, things like that, where you can look up what stuff has been selling for, as well as the Overstreet Price Guide, of course. Um, You have, uh, um, I think, a more conservative type of convention experience. It's a little bit more sterile in the sense that I don't think you're, you're, you're not getting that guy who's buying a table with, and bringing his original collection over to the convention. That doesn't happen as much anymore, unfortunately. But when it did, it was it was amazing. You know, you find some great stuff. Um, yeah, and then, and then I remember the first convention I ever went to out of state was, I believe, and it's got to be, I think, 93 or 94, I went to um, Chicago, what is now the Wizard Chicago Show in Rosemont. And that was the wild, wild west. That's where you could buy. You know, bring as much money as you can, and you're going to spend it. No, absolutely. And I would imagine in a, in a pre-internet era, you know, having that access via conventions mm. to product, to context, information, uh, I'm sure that was invaluable. And again, you know, talking about how you built up your business, I mean, yeah, the fact that you were able to acquire stock, you know, actual merchandise at these places. Mm. And I mean, I'm assuming cultivate your network through yes. there as well. Yes. Yes. And it was very interesting. I remember the first time I went to San Diego Comic-Con, which I think was 94, just realizing how different California buyers were compared to New York buyers. And the same thing in the South when I went to Dragon Con or Heroes Con in Charlotte. And you just realize, uh, and even the Midwest, I mean, people are very different in different parts of the country in terms of their buying habits. Uh, For instance, uh, California is very laid back. You don't say. They they do (laughs) not like being pressured, whereas in New York, you can pressure somebody and they'll tell you to go scratch your ass or they'll buy the book. Right. And the South was also was very interesting where they'd say, hey, I'm going to walk around the show, but uh, I'll come back later. And you'd go in New York, you'd go, this guy's never coming back. And sure enough, like two hours later, the guy would come back and buy a book, but they were just very right. relaxed about how they did things. And, and of course, in the early days and maybe still today, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, when they when they see the New York dealer coming, they go, oh, it's it's that guy from New York. You know, I don't think it's as bad as it used to be, but they, you know, and we thought that we were. We were just sharp, and we went at a different at a different speed. Uh, not to take anything away from from dealers from any other part of the country, there are, there are a lot of very very smart guys out there in every part of the country in terms to, in when it comes to uh, knowledge of comics and pricing and things. Yeah, I mean, this is a question I posed to Ben as well when he was here. You know, now you you're so well established. Do you find that now you have young dealers coming up to you trying to learn your ways? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we've helped some people establish themselves as 
professionals in the business uh, in a variety of different manners. Um, I'm always happy to take a call and help somebody because when I got out of college and I decided I was doing this full time, there were a lot of guys who helped me out. Um, one in particular, uh, Bill Ponsetti, uh, who owned a company called More Fun Comic Books, uh, More Fun Comics in uh, Louisiana. And he was just such a nice guy. He would sit on the phone with me and... Um, teach me uh and, and i'd go through the gerber photo journals which was a, a huge reference book that i mean just a very big influence it opened my eyes to a lot of titles i never would have seen comic books i never would have known about and he was very very uh a very good guy to me michael carbonaro as well um who i started traveling with at conventions people always thought we were like business partners but we, we were, you know we had a very strong business relationship uh, and we did start Big Apple conventions together with uh, Vince Gula when it, the first one was the Show Must Go On show. But we can get into that a little bit later. Um, so, uh, and and I definitely learned a lot from my partner, Stephen Fischler, probably in, in my mind the most knowledgeable person on the face of this planet when it comes to vintage comic books. Um, and there were so many other people out there who helped me in a variety of different ways, teaching me and um, being a friend and a, a mentor uh, and what you do is you find those guys that you want to be like and you model yourself after them in a variety of different ways. And then once again, you take what's out there and you make it your own. So uh, these are all important things that uh, helped me to establish myself and become the comic guy that I am nowadays. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to learn from people who think differently than you. If you're only stuck in a little bubble, you know, you're not going to really progress. Yeah, well said. I mean, you know, even when I do these episodes, not so much the main My Comic Shop History episodes, but if I do a book club episode or a movie club or something like that, I want to have people on the show who don't have exactly the same opinions as myself. It makes it more interesting. And yeah, it, it can be a learning experience. Yeah. If you're a regular listener of My Comic Shop History, then you know that I'm a big fan of both Mighty Morphin Power Rangers as well as Funko Pops. So it's probably not a huge shock to learn that I picked up the newly released wave of Power Ranger Pops, including the helmetless versions of the Rangers, as well as, at long last, the major villains, Goldar, Rita, and Zed. The Pops are great, they look awesome on the shelf, and of course I picked them up at Undiscovered Realm. Undiscovered Realm is one of our sponsors this season, and they are also my go-to place for Funko Pops. So for all of your pop and gaming needs, be sure to check out Undiscovered Realm. You can visit them in person in White Plains, New York, online at undiscoveredrealm.com, or at comic book conventions across the country, including the upcoming New York Comic Con. And now, as the Red Ranger used to say, back to action. So in terms of, again, convention history and your evolution, and the evolution of cons themselves, you've seen at least two major trends. Mm. Two things that people often complain about, so I'm curious to kind of get your take <laughs> on it. One is the proliferation of shows, and that's a common complaint. Too many conventions, mm. and the uh, the infusion of pop culture elements, sometimes, okay. as some argue, at the expense of comics. So I guess first, I mean, how and when did you see these things start to happen? It, it, that's a great question, and I think they've always been around, but in a variety of uh, different ways but not not as uh, prevalent but i do remember uh, fred greenberg in the early 90s telling me he's like yeah we're we're going to be expanding the scope of this comic book conventions because his vision was that comic book conventions would become multimedia shows which is what he called them i think today is what we call a pop culture convention sure and that was very interesting to me um and there are times uh if you're not making sales and you see a bunch of cosplayers you get very irritated but they're, you know, when you're having a good show and you see all these amazing people with these great costumes and they're, and they're having so much fun, and that's part of the spectacle. In fact, for the first time in my life, I did cosplay at San Diego Comic Con this year. Uh, I went as uh, Wolverine. I saw it, uh, man. It looked great. And I had such a great time. I felt very goofy at first, but, you know, um, once you get into it, in, and you realize everybody's out there having fun. It, it was really a blast. I'm you not, get a little bit of a charge from it, right? It was cool. It was cool when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, can I get a picture with you? And you're like, oh, yeah, sure. And somebody says, that's the best Wolverine I've seen all day. I was like, wow, that's that's really neat to hear. My wife and I had that experience at Comic-Con last year. We cosplayed as uh, Matt Murdock and Elektra. First time either of us had ever cosplayed. And we weren't expecting anything. And right away, people were asking to take photos with us. And it was it was, it was an ego boost. Mm. It was just such a different way to experience the convention. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of lot of fun. Um, Did you walk the floor like that? Yeah, stay, yeah, yeah okay. I walked the floor. And, and I had... <laughs> had metal claws which everybody was like how the hell did you get those past security i, was like, I don't know i just put them in my bag and when i got through i 
I put them on and uh, they looked great. It was, it was a really uh, fun time. Um, and it made that made the convention a little bit less stressful as well. Um, Did you do it all the days or just one? Just one day. Just one. I, I really, I mean, it was, were people pushing you to do this or was it something you always uh, wanted to do? I had, I had done Wolverine for Halloween. We, we, every year um, I have a Halloween party. My wife and I have a Halloween party and we were right on the pa- parade route here in Manhattan. And every year we do a different costume. Um, I was the crow one year. I was 11 from Stranger Things one year. Uh, I was a flying monkey and my wife was the uh, Wicked Witch one year. Uh, God, we've done so many things. One night we were Boris and Natasha and our friends were um, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Uh, so I had a lot of fun. This year I, I did uh, I did Wolverine and it it really, uh, it looked good. I was like really pleased with it. And I said, oh, you know what? Maybe I could do this in San Diego and... And I wasn't planning on it. And then a friend, I, I brought everything with me. And then I, at the, like when I was out there, I was like, oh, I don't think I'm going to do this. This is, this is too much. Then a buddy of mine said, hey, I'm going to do <laughs> five, five to six hours of body paint to be Venom um, to, f- tomorrow at the show. And I was like, really? And I was like, okay, I'll do Wolverine. If you're doing that, I'll do Wolverine. And we had like battle pictures of him as Venom and me as nice. Wolverine. And we had a lot of fun. Um, do you feel so, like now you will look more kindly upon those cosplayers who aren't buying your I, comics? I, I do. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I always take pictures with them. I do look on them very favorably because I do um, understand and appreciate that these people are passionate about this. They're having fun. The only times I ever get irritated is <laughs> when we're not making sales. And you like feel like, oh, my God, there's no buyers here. There's just people here for the uh, toys and the uh, and the cosplayers but but um, I have to say that San Diego in particular has been an incredible show for the last bunch of years um, the shows uh, you know you talk about too many shows um, the market will decide that you know if the show's not profitable they won't run them right so obviously there's a demand for this and I mean we just saw the beginnings of uh, Ace Con- Comic Con uh, which is basically the Founders of the Wizard Convention started Ace, where they're they're gearing it much more towards celebrity signatures. I mean, they had like the, they had Justice, the Justice League, League yeah, cast. It's, yeah, it's amazing. So uh, they have had Avengers, they have a Justice League. They they really have a, a great connection with Hollywood, and they're able to pull those off. Um, San Diego has San Diego and WonderCon. Um, then the Reed Convention, which I think overall are probably the best run conventions, and they, they're all over the world now, which is very impressive. Uh, also, my brother Sal uh, and his partner Dave O'Hare. Uh, his business partner, they run Garden State Comic Fest, and they do a great show. It's a very old school type of feel. Very nice show. I had Dave on the season premiere of my comic shop history. We talked about the running of the show, and then I was there. I went uh, just one of the days, and I did some filming for the documentary. Mm. I filmed your booth, but alas, not you personally. I, I was what running, happened to you? I, I, I had gotten injured um, <laughs> I saw you and I was like, all right, I'll text you when I'm at your booth. And then the next thing I know. <laughs> oh man, that was a, that was a, a very, very horrible day. I, I was, um, I, I have very tight IT bands I found out and it almost felt like my fibula popped out of place and I couldn't get up and I had to be rushed to uh, urgent care and, uh, made it back to the convention eventually with crutches and a leg brace. Uh, and, um, uh, later that night, took some painkillers, and I was okay the next day. But uh, it happened to me again the day before I had to leave for San Diego. Uh, since then, I've been using a, a foam roller. and uh, Foam really roller's st- great, man, Yeah, right? they are. Yeah. And I've been stretching a lot, so that hasn't bothered me any, as much anymore. And I, I'm, I'm 47 years old. I try to stay active. I, I'm in the gym every every other day, and I play soccer once a week, and uh, I've been doing that for over a dozen years now. Uh, and I think it's really important. Uh, you see a lot of guys in our business who are very sedentary, uh, heavy, overweight, and I don't think that's a, a healthy way to be in general. But as a, as a comic guy, it's so easy to fall into that, you know, junk food, pop culture. Especially at conventions on the road, my yeah, goodness. But uh, it, it's good that you're not perpetuating those stereotypes. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Any other uh, Comic-Con calamities? Yeah, like well, that? well uh, I, went, I, I, I once, uh, right before San Diego, I was playing soccer, and this guy, we collided, our knees collided, and the next day I was on a plane with an ice pack, and when I got off the plane, I could not um, bend my leg. I had to go to the emergency room, got a soft cast and crutches, and I was basically hobbling around a convention. Uh, the only other 
incredibly bad experience I had at a convention was in like 1990, I think it was five or six. Uh, someone stole my four bo best boxes of comic books while I was unloading, uh, excuse me, uh, loading uh, to, at the end of a show. It was on April 2nd, and I thought somebody had been playing a... a an April Fool's joke on me, and it wasn't, and I lost about uh, forty thousand dollars worth of comic books. So actually, that was something that I wanted to ask you about: is mm. security, because again, you are bringing some incredibly valuable comics. Yeah. And on that note, again, even if you're listening to this, and, and maybe you didn't know Metropolis by name, undoubtedly, if you've been to any of these, especially these big conventions, you've seen the Metropolis display. You guys have the glass cases. I yeah. mean, you go all out. Yeah. But how do you secure? Well, we, we don't we don't leave very valuable comic books at the convention. We have them secured, and we don't leave it. Uh, without security there. We also usually have undercover security at our booths, so people don't know that, but uh, we have guys watching all the time, and we don't really leave anything out anymore. Yeah. Um, everything's in glass displays. If you want to see a book, you're going to ask us from our inventory list to see a book, and we st our, our, our salespeople will stand with you. And um, it's, it's very safe nowadays, but back then I, I got ripped off, and I was miserable because I had no insurance, and this was about... You know, a month of, oh, woe is me. And then one day I woke up and I said to myself, I'll never forget this. I said, you know, if I keep acting like this, then these guys really stole something from me. And I vowed from that day forward. It's like a, a, an a origin story for a comic book uh, superhero. I said, from this day forward, I will work 10 times harder, smarter, and faster than I've ever worked before. And within uh, about a month and a half, I was back at break even in terms of paying off consigners whose books I had as well as I mean it was one collection I bought the night before the convention and it was all gone so it's it's pretty it was pretty devastating but it also taught me that I can overcome any obstacle that comes my way and it was one of the it was also a great lesson I learned from my father which was knowledge is power and more to the point I think uh, taking that knowledge and putting it into action is power as well and so i just basically poured myself into making like a hundred phone calls a day going to every convention i could doing everything i possibly could uh to to get back to where i needed to be yeah you know i mean i, I can only imagine what you felt like in that moment and i'm sure it's you know a tough pill to swallow but yeah in moments like that i think yeah the best thing you can do is at least use it for something positive and yeah. you know i mean so then did you uh implement anything differently in terms uh, yeah of i never i never that? i never asked uh brad savage to watch my comic books while i was loading a car up with uh comics brad's a very nice guy but i asked him specifically to watch my stuff and when i came back up his back was to my my boxes my booth and i and they were gone and i looked at him mm -hmm. i said Dude, I asked you to watch myself. So I am watching it. I said, with your back fa to, to my boxes, they're all gone. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Uh, Brad's an okay guy and whatever, but I mean, that happened. That's a fact. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Truth is an absolute defense. Yeah. <laughs> In uh, Speaking of your booth and your setup at these conventions, you know, I'll be perfectly honest. I mean, I, I saw your before long before I knew you or mm -hmm. knew anything about your operation. You know, I would see your booth at uh, New York Comic Con or San Diego and... You know, again, to be honest, I think I was always a little intimidated, not be, by, because of anything that, you know, you and your guys did, but I just felt like, well, I don't, I'm not spending thousands of dollars. Like, I was intimidated to even go in and look. Do you find, and I see, I see people taking photos with you and all of that, so I guess maybe I know the answer, but do you get the sense, like, people are, are ever, like, again, like, intimidated, like I might have been? Um, I hear that. And it's so hard for me to understand that because I, th I hope you can tell by talking to yeah. me and meeting me that that's the furthest thing from the truth and my staff as well. No, that's the thing. It was never anything personal. Like it wasn't sure. like I walked by and anyone glared at me or it was like <laughs> nothing like that. It was more, I think the books themselves. I don't know. <laughs> sure. No, I, I, it's, it's the presentation. It's the quality of the books. I get that. But that should never be something that should stop anybody um, from coming over and saying hello or talking about yeah. comic books with us. Cause well, now I will, for sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, but my guys are extremely passionate about comics. They love to talk to people about stuff. So uh, I, I don't know how we could undo that other than to not bring great books to the show, which I don't want to do. No, you don't want to deprive uh, people. And again, no. I see, you know, I see all the photos that you post of, of people coming and posing with the books and things like mm -hmm. that. And again, my goodness, when I was here last time, you know, we filmed, uh, you know, you handing me the action one. So I know that's a thing and people get into it. How, how do you feel about that? Like when people, they're not necessarily there to buy, but they want to take a photo with it, the book or if, something. If somebody's respectful about it and asks nicely, I'm more than happy to. Sometimes you get some yahoos that, that are just, you can tell, are just total goofballs, and you're not really sure they're even going to know how to handle a book, and you're a little bit uh, 
skeptical about doing. So what I'll do is I'll hold the book, you know, or take a picture yeah. or, or say, hey, sorry, guys, we're really busy right now. But and sometimes we actually are. You know, yeah. you know come back later. We, we can do it later. Um, but for the most part, you know, we're just very careful about that type of thing. So I wanted to ask you, and speaking of the number of shows, like I wanted to ask you about how you choose which shows to go to. And I would imagine, so I would love to know that. And then also, I would imagine your metric for whether or not a convention is successful is different than... Mm a traditional vendor or a traditional comic shop that sets up, right? I mean, you could sell one book and the whole weekend is worth Right, so sure, that's true. Um, one of the things is that um, we, we've had to pare down the number of shows we do because of all the auctions we do. Uh, it takes a lot of resources from the office that we really need here and, and also the gallery. And um, so we do, we do uh, San Diego, uh, both Chicago shows. Yeah, you were um, just at Wizard World. Wizard Chicago, World, right? yeah, which was great this year. And last year it was really bad so it's, you know go figure um c2e2 has been really fun new york comic con we do we do the big apple conventions because of my uh history with michael and the convention i do garden state comic fest it's my brother's convention and i think it's a very cool old school feel type of show uh so i you know i i, I love it like yesterday i was I, I forget where i was but yesterday i was just thinking, wow, I, I haven't been to a toy convention ever. I would like to go to a toy convention. i got to go find one in Jersey. I know there's a bunch of them. And I, uh, I love toys, too. It's, it's yeah. cool. Um, and, and so turning in terms of picking conventions, we've, we've actually just been paring it down more and more every year. And we, we were doing London. I've, I've gone to Luca Comic Convention in, uh, in Italy. I've been to conventions in the Middle East. Um, I, I was just invited to go to conventions in Australia. I don't, I'm not going to be able to make it this year, but I might do it next next year uh turn into like a vacation and, and do it so we'll see uh it's it's comic books have taken me all over the world and it's been really exciting the conventions are great uh just to give you a quick um so we don't forget to cover this i'll tell you a little bit about big apple conventions yeah no i, I definitely wanted to get to that because i again i think it's a great story and also you know mike carbonaro while he you know he won't be on the show this season i know he's a figure who that looms large on the convention scene he is he's a, i mean he's how do you a, describe him generally he's a larger than life character and and one of my dearest friends in the comic book business and also a guy who taught me a lot and um, anytime you think you're working hard, you just look at Mike and realize <laughs> you need to step up your game because he is uh, he is one of the hardest working men in comic books. And so, how uh, did you get how did you get uh, linked up with him? Um, Mike? I met through a convention. I consigned some stuff to him, and then uh, um, found a deal that we split together. And then it was kind of we kept working together from there. Bought my first action one with Mike. Uh, actually, and uh, my partner Stephen, and uh, Mike and I, we were we were setting up. Uh, we were going to set up for Fred Greenberg's Great Eastern Convention at the New York Coliseum, which is where the Time Warner Center is now on 59th uh, Street in Columbus Circle. So we were all in a row. This is, I believe, it was March 1996, and it was chilly out, and we were all sitting there in our cars, getting ready to load in and Fred Greenberg I see him walking and he's stopping at each car and talking to them and he comes up to us and he's like uh, the convention's canceled and we're like what do you mean he's like, well I didn't get the floor plan approved by the fire marshal and they won't let us have the convention and I'm sitting there going why didn't you have the floor plan approved by the fire marshal that's like one of the things you have to do especially in New York uh, and it was canceled there was no way to get that show rolling and basically Michael and I, along with a friend, Vince Gula, who was a dealer from Pennsylvania, we started running around trying to figure out how we can make this show happen. And the first thing we did was we, took, we got in a car with Fred Greenberg and we drove to the Javits Center to see if we could put it on there. But I think it was like $180,000 to do it. And his backer was not willing to lose even more money and so and what kind of it, attendance are we talking about here like how many people were planning to go to this show uh, roughly my guess 30,000 people I don't know I don't know 20 30,000 yeah. people I think it was a big big show sure. so um, this was crazy uh, we basically Mike Mike said hey I remember there's this church uh, not too far from here where they have a big basement maybe we can go rent that out and so we, we went over there and sure enough, the guy was like, yeah, it was 10,000 square foot basement auditorium at the St. Paul the Apostle uh, Church. And 
we ended up running what we called the Show Must Go On show. Uh, free admission. We got as many of the dealers over there. People had flown in from Japan, from all over the country, everywhere. And um, we ended up uh, uh, putting together a show within, I think, so that was like Thursday, Friday, and I think Saturday was the show. So it was unbelievable. How did you get the word out to everybody? This was like very, very much in the very, very early stages of the internet. There was, I mean, God, I could barely use a computer. I was pathetic. It was, but we had somebody who helped us with that. And then we, um, we, we had literally people standing outside all day and night with flyers at the New York Coliseum telling people, and we had a, a, a guy walking them over to the church. And That's smart. Yeah, yeah, we did. And we, there were a throng of people. And I remember we had like a table filled with free giveaways. And I remember when the doors opened and all these people rushed through the door and were so happy to have a convention. I remember, I don't know if you you might be too young to remember this, but Toyota used to have these commercials, Oh, What a Feeling. And you, they, the, the person would jump up in the air. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I remember jumping up in the air in just sheer and utter happiness that we were able to pull this off and, in a certain way, give back to the comic book community. And I, I loved it that people were coming up to us after the show saying this was the best convention they'd ever been to. It was, it was such a great old school feel to it. We had more artists than we had dealers. That was really, really cool. That's yeah. so. At that point, was and what is his nickname? Carbo, right? Is yeah, that Carbo. His name? Yeah. At this point, was he had he been organizing conventions, or was this the? Well, I'm sure. Yeah, he had in the past done conventions. He once did a rock and roll show. Uh, he's done all types of stuff. Uh, Mike used to have his own conventions where he was the only one selling in the room. <laughs> so he had an entire room filled with stuff, and, and it, all his people were there. But they were, you know, if you went in there, there was only one dealer in the room. But, and, but was this your first experience with organizing a show? Yeah, this is, and it was uh, it was very stressful, but also very gratifying. Once again, to give back to the comic book community, what, we lost money running the show. Um, for the rent of the room and what we charged the dealers, but in business, why you know business, what we sold was made it very very worthwhile, and it was um and there was a need in the market yeah that you recognize yeah. right I think that entrepreneurial spirit yeah, that, that you've well, demonstrated right from we, selling on the street listen, and this, all was, that. This, this was it was very practical this was a weekend where we needed to make money and yeah. and <laughs> we didn't have it so we had to come up with something and basically I remember that summer. Mike was, we were on a plane going out to San Diego and he wanted to run, started running conventions. He's like, I don't want to do it. That was so much hard work. I just don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And he's like, oh, I'm going to do it by myself if you don't want to do it with me. And by the end of the plane, right before, by the time we touched down in San Diego, he convinced me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'll do it with you. And we started running the conventions and uh, we ran a few. Um, one of my favorite uh, memories of the convention was at our first show, we had a $1,000 costume contest the winner would get a thousand bucks and mike had a live band playing in the room we had a rock and roll band playing in the room and, and they were doing covers from tv series and cartoons and all types of rock and roll stuff mike i think uh, sang a uh, secret agent man and um then um there, there was a there was a costume contest there was a, a four guys dressed as kiss and they, I think they came in second place. Uh, Jim Stranko was our guest of honor. But anyway, after, after this costume contest was over, the guys dressed up as Kiss. I saw them. I was like, oh, you guys look great. And I'm like, How, you know, what made you decide to do Kiss? He's like, oh, we're a cover band. I said, really? He's like, yeah, do you want us to play? I was like, really? And he got on, you know, got, grabbed the guitars and the mic and the drums. And we basically had a Kiss concert at our comic convention. That's and it really was cool. so cool, man. And my dad... Um, uh, did the concessions. So th I, to this day, I will say the best food ever at a comic book convention was at Big Apple conventions. And my father did all the um, food for the convention. He did um, meatball heroes, sausage and pepper heroes. It was just off the charts. You're but, making me hungry here, yeah, sir. Oh, it was incredible. The funniest part of that convention, I remember my uh, Mike and I were talking in the front of the convention center going over some business stuff. And all of a sudden, there was a stage in the back and there's a microphone, and all of a sudden we see my father at the microphone, and he's tapping it, you know, and he goes, hello, I'm a the chef. I make the spicy meatballs, and I know washing my hands. And, and Mike and I are like, what the hell's my dad doing? I've never seen this. The entire convention stopped, <laughs> and everybody turned to my father and started clapping, because he was hysterical, but the food was that good. So that was uh, also a very cool memory from the 
comic cons that I ran. Uh, after a while, though, I realized it was just too much work for me. I wish I had had better um, management skills at the time and been able to uh, delegate responsibilities better um, because I've, I've, as we've seen, um, running conventions can be very profitable. Uh, but I, I basically uh, walked away from the convention business and Michael to this day is still running it. And uh, so that's why I still do Big Apple. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really funny. So, you know, again, I've spent a lot of time at comic shops and talking to retailers and I know how challenging it can be to run that business. But then, I, I don't know, I find the running of a convention even more daunting. Like, there's just so much going on. Uh, and again, like talking to Dave in the in the premiere episode of this season and hearing everything that goes into the show, mm-hmm. you know, so, I mean, that's understandable. Have In the, in the years since, uh, have you given any thought to mounting something on your own? Like, I know Torpedo Comics, right? Another dealer yeah. of, like, really high-end books. They do their own yeah, cons. Yeah, they're doing a con. Uh, they do, I think they do a couple of them. Do you go to those? Uh, I, I, my, my team was at uh, the... Um, Pre San Diego Con, right? But is um, that anything that appeals to you? Like we would like to to mount something like that on your own? Not in the least. Yeah. The only thing I I wouldn't mind doing something on a small scale. Like I I had wanted to do a comic art convention, and just never found the time to do it. And and uh, some other people are doing them right now, which they're doing a great job with them. Um, I I do give a lot of uh, props to my brother and Dave. They do a great job with Garden State. They make it seem effortless. They also do. A convention. Uh, they did an Atlantic City convention this past winter, and they also do a convention with um, Great Adventure theme yeah. parks, which is really cool. So, you know, if you have the time and the ability, they can be very profitable and, and fun. Um, for me, I, I'm sticking with what I do right now, which is buying and selling and auctioning and the art gallery. I've have, I have my hands full though. I, I gotta say, uh, the idea of having, if I could find the right people to having a metropolis convention would be really cool. Yeah. Kind of on that note, one of the last things that I wanted to ask you, you know, we mentioned Carbonaro and, you know, him being this larger than life figure. I mean, how much showmanship is involved in what you do because I feel like whether you're talking about convention dealers or comic shop owners, as, as as I've experienced, you know, a lot of a lot of them, you are characters. So, like, how much showmanship is involved, and is that something that comes naturally to you, or do you feel like you have to tap into something to get there? Uh, I think that there are a lot of big personalities in the comic book world, uh, interesting personalities, and everybody's a little bit different. Some guys are a little bit more subdued, and everybody has their way of being. For me, I'm just who I am. This is who I am. Uh, I love comic books. I love talking about comic books. I like to think I'm a friendly and funny guy, and we have a good time when we're, we're hanging out and doing business or, or whatever. So what, what, what's it all about? If you're not, if you're not enjoying yourself, what are you, what are you doing it for? You know. So, um, yes, uh, there are times where you have to be a salesman and there are, there are times where you have to, to portray yourself in a certain manner. But I think in the essence, uh, there, um, whoever you're talking about, whether it be Ben or Mike or me or my partner Steven or a whole host of you know dozens of other comic store owners and dealers, there is a personality there. There is an essence of truth to who they are, whether they're exaggerating it during conversations or not, I don't know. But uh, I find uh, that the cast of characters throughout our hobby uh, some of the most uh, interesting and fun and uh, very, very smart guys that I've met. And um, it's, it's a blast. It's a blast. And, uh, you know, when we're at conventions, even though, you know, we're all dealers and we're competing against one another, there's a certain sense of camaraderie amongst us. You know, we're, we are definitely competing in, in that's true, but we go out to dinner together, we laugh together, we, we you know help each other out where we can. Um, at this last wizard convention, uh, Leroy Harper, a really great guy, guy from a dealer from Kentucky, had an amazing fantasy 15 and 5.0 stolen. Ted Van Lu from uh, Superworld up in Massachusetts had some comic books stolen. And it's just heartbreaking when you hear these types of things. So you try to get the word out like I am right now. <laughs> so if anybody sees any stolen comic books, let us know. Um, but, uh, you know, I also, there's one other thing I wanted to touch on, um, which I enjoyed, and part of the reason I was willing to do the interview with you is I used to have a radio show online called ComicZoneRadio.com, and, and it's still up and live, though I haven't added any new material in quite some time. It was one of the joys of my life to be able to do uh, 
that show and interview many of my uh, idols. You know, I got to interview Stan Lee twice. I got to interview Todd McFarlane. I got to interview um, Frank Miller. You know, uh, so many of the, the the giants of our industry I got to interview. And it really helped me a lot to learn about the industry and also how to communicate in a better way. And one of the best things I learned, which I think you've done a great job because I'm a motor mouth and can keep going for hours, is to ask the question and just sit back and listen. Uh, let your guests talk, and that's a great thing to do um, because people don't need to know how smart you are. They want to learn about your guest who's on the show. Yeah, no, well said. Uh, just as we as we exit here, any notable uh, visitors to your booth at conventions? I mean, especially, I guess, in terms of like a San Diego Comic-Con where you have the strong Hollywood presence. Mm. Um, I mean, I guess it could be notable within the comic field as well, but specifically, like, any, any celebrity visitors to the booth? Not, you know, they, they, they do come by the booth but, you know, I, I like to think that everybody who comes by our booth feels like a celebrity when they're there. Because we try to really treat and cater people with respect and courtesy. And, um, you know, while the goal is obviously to sell product and sell vintage comic books, there's also this feeling, uh, and I hope it comes through, is that, you know, we are there to ha to talk about comic books, to yeah, help. Outreach. Yeah, and, you know, and, and to have a good time. You know, we, we want to share with people our passion for comic books. So, I mean, I have Bob Burden, the creator of Flaming Carrot and Mystery Men, who came by the booth. We sold a comic book for him this, this summer. That was really cool. I'm sure there's a bunch of others. We've had, we've had uh, guys from The Simpsons by... Um, we've had, uh, Bill Moomy has been by our booth in the past. Um, I, uh, we used to sell comic books to Mark Hamill from Star Wars. It's just so many, so many really cool. Thomas Jane from the, who started as the Punisher. Dave Mandel, who is the director of Veep. He, he's, he was by the booth. He has a uh, tremendous collection. Tremendous he was profiled collection. in the New York Times and yeah, it was incredible. That, it's, it's pretty mind blowing. Um, Jonathan Ross, who is, a big time, uh, late night talk show host in England he's he's been by our booth many times um, so there's a whole host of different people um, but once again you know you, celebrities are great and, and that's really cool uh, it's fun to, to see people who have reached a certain level in, of, of notoriety in, in, the, in pop culture and the public eye buying but you know we're happy to sell to you know anybody everybody so it's it's totally cool yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope listeners will stop by the Metropolis booth the next time they catch you at a convention. Uh, so, New York Comic Con, you will be there? Yeah, we will be at New York Comic Con. We'll have a 10 by 20 booth, uh, beautifully displayed, showcasing comic books for sale and artwork for sale, as well as previews for our next event auction on ComicConnect.com, which will be starting in November and ending in December. We're actually still taking uh, consignments up until September 17th. For me, you know, I, I hope you, you can tell by my voice and, well, you, Anthony, my smile on my face, this is still a thrill for me. This is something that I'm very passionate about and I really enjoy and have fun doing. Um, That's great that you've been able to maintain that level of passion with something that is now your business. At yeah. this point, do you find people are bringing collections to you? I mean, how much hunting do you have to do at this it's, point? It goes both ways. You hunt and, and people bring you stuff. It's a little bit of everything. And uh, you try to just uh, buy as much stuff as you possibly can. And uh, make sure that um, you're, you're keeping uh, the inventory filled with great stuff that people will want to buy. Or, I heard someone make an appointment while I was waiting. Yeah. Very, very, very quick, painless yeah. process. Yeah, it's really easy. We're not like a standoff type of place here. It's very easy to, to make an appointment with us, to come in and look at comic books. You pick what you want off the site. We have it pulled for you. You come on in. You sit down. It's a very cool experience because you're surrounded by a comic, vintage comic books and original comic art. We also have Metropolis Gallery. Uh, the website's metropolisgallerynyc.com. And we run uh, art shows here. And the next art show is going to be the Friday night of New York Comic Con, which I believe is October 5th, whatever that Friday night is. I believe yeah. it's October 5th. And from 7, uh, excuse me, 6 to 9, we are going to have the artwork of uh, Simone Bianchi. He's an Italian painter, and he just completed an entire Marvel Masterpieces card set. And the artwork is absolutely fantastic i think i you saw some of it while you were setting up yes. your gear um this guy is just amazing and he hit it out of the ballpark with uh with this uh set of art it's going to be a very impressive show anybody who's listening you're more than welcome to come on down we're at 36 west 37th street sixth floor 
metropolisgallerynyc.com. And uh, obviously, if you wanted to buy comic books and or artwork, you can look at our sites, metropoliscomics.com or comicconnect.com, and you can make an appointment to come in and pick them up, uh, look at them, order through the mail. We ship all over the world, and our Comic Connect event auctions are probably... Uh, one of my favorite things that we do because they're so exciting. They're so chock full of incredible material, diverse material. And once again, material for all different types of budgets from a couple of hundred dollar comic book or a piece of art to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of um, priced comic books or valued comic books. Yeah. Very cool. Artwork. Well, well, there you have it. Hopefully people will, uh, will check that out. I hope to see you all come by or give us a call sometime. If you have a collection for sale, we're buying. If you have a collection uh, to con- consign, we're taking consignments all the time. And um, love to uh, meet as many people as I can in the comic book world. Well, Vincent, I thank you very much for your time. I know you were feeling a little under the weather today. You, it didn't seem to slow you down, though. You rallied like a champ. <laughs> I love talking about comic books. So, well, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me here. Thank you to everyone for listening. Be sure to head on over to the My Comic Shop History Patreon page for the exclusive after show. Don't be a flat squirrel. My Comic Shop History returns with an all-new episode in just two weeks. In the meantime, additional exclusive content awaits at the My Comic Shop History Patreon page. Including the after show, my guest this week is 13th Dimension's Dan Greenfield. Head on over to patreon.com slash mycomicshophistory and sign up. Thank <laughs> you.